assalamu alaikum everyone uh, while i was driving here this morning it's incredibly cold and it reminded me of my days of living in boston where uh, it was incredibly cold the day i arrived i remember uh, you know sort of uh, kind of the same experience that i had walking up to this auditorium and that also reminded me of what i wanted to talk about it so when i first arrived at mit this is um, in in early 2000s i got off the plane and and got into a cab and the cab driver was a pakistani and he asked me where do you want to go and i said i want to go to mit and he said we don't really get lots of pakistanis wanted to go there so i told him that i have a talk today uh, i have a faculty candidate talk today got really happy that and dropped me off and didn't ask for any money he said this is my contribution to you wanting to get a job at mit and he but he dropped me off in the middle of a road it's called the main street and i asked him where mit is and he said go through this hotel it used to be marriott hotel it's now a different hotel go through this door and when you come out on the other side of the hotel on this revolving door you'll find another street that street is mit and this was sort of you know just a street with random buildings on both sides of that road mostly rented and dilapidated and there was the first time that it struck me that one of the best technical engineering universities in the world doesn't have a proper campus doesn't have facilities that we are used to this was literally rented buildings on both sides of the road in cambridge in massachusetts so i started walking down that road kept asking people where the computer science lab is pointing me to a random building which is where i arrived and then i told them that i have a talk here on the 6th floor they said the elevator is broken you may want to take stairs now i took the stairs it was raining that day and uh, they had a kind of a leaky roof so there was rain all over those kind of stairs with cigarette butts and old pizza boxes so i took those stairs all the way to the 6th floor arrived there and announced that here i am for my talk they're all right we have a much bigger professor nobel laureate coming here today so he has booked the big auditorium you can give the talk in the hallway and that's where i ended up giving my talk and uh, someone brought in a projector put it out desk the desk was too low so this was three old pizza boxes one on top of the other then a projector on top and that's how uh, my talk was projected some of the people who came were you know sort of wearing shorts and sandals even though it was really cold there sat in the hallway some sat on the floor these were literally the people who textbooks had read growing up reading computer science and they so sort of listen to my talk ask questions and as someone would ask me a question i would pause to recognize them because i'd only seen pictures of them on the web on their websites and this was someone who written the textbook for data structures and algorithms or a textbook for operating systems or a textbook for computer security all maybe dollar billionaires all people who change the world in significant dressed in shorts and sandals sitting in a hallway in a building that was rented dilapidated with leaky roof where the elevator was broken this was the computer science lab of mit now this was sort of quite a interesting experience and i went there from cambridge which is like a campus of the size of a city right so cambridge is almost an academic town so this was sort of you know this was an interesting experience so i kept thinking what is it that makes mit so special and this experience still didn't stop you know i eventually got hired and many months later i was i was allocated a course and was given an, a little hall where i could go and teach that course on a graduate course so it's like a, a enrollment of about 30 students and as i found out that that lecture hall at mit did not have a projector didn't have any laptops or computers installed there and and it was snowing by the time this course was allocated to me so every every other morning i would take my projector my laptop and a portable projection screen which are quite heavy and would plomp through the snow to go to this lecture hall set myself up there and lecture a bunch of 30 30 odd kids 
mildly interested in what I had to teach. So the question was, what is it that makes MIT so special? It certainly wasn't the facilities. You know, it wasn't the way they were treating their professors. It was my lecture. So what is it that makes MIT so special? I think MIT was equally perplexed about it. So they actually commissioned a report by Bank Boston called The Impact of Innovation. You can Google that report. But here's the big finding that that report had. What that report said was that MIT alumni have founded 28,500 companies worldwide, which employ 3 million people and generate an annual revenue of $1.7 trillion. If MIT was a country, it will be the 11th largest by GDP in the world. It's not just MIT. You go to the other side of the US, to what is called the West Coast, and add Stanford to this equation. If MIT and Stanford are combined, the companies founded by their alumni employ 8.4 million people. They generate a combined revenue of over $5 trillion. If MIT and Stanford were a country, they'll be the fourth richest country in the world ahead of Germany by GDP. That's the impact of innovation. Once you have these innovative entrepreneurial engineers, founding companies coming out of these great universities, that's the impact these people can have. This is the impact that innovation can have not just on the economy of a country, but on the world. The world would be a poorer place if it didn't have an innovative engine in the US, the MITs and Stanford's fueling it. That's the impact of innovation. Now let me come back to Pakistan and also tell you that we are very fortunate that we live in a country which is ripe for innovation. It is ripe for innovation because of three reasons. One, this room is full of young people, which is what I like. And let me share an interesting fact with you. Do you know what's the average age of a Pakistani? Average age of a Pakistani? 22. Average age of a Pakistani is 22. What's the average age of an American? Average age of an American, 38. What's the average age of a Japanese? 48. Japan, well past its era of innovation. America, just about to miss that boat. It's countries like Pakistan that's going to catch that boat. Why? Because we have the right demographic for it. We have young people, they're tech-savvy, ambitious, they want to work hard, they still have the fire in their belly. This whole country is only about 22 years old. That is incredible. There are very few countries in the world that have such a young demographic. Two, I typically divide Pakistan in three different eras, 1940s, 1960s and 2000s. Do you know what's unique about three, these three eras? In 1940s, imagine you went to a great university in Pakistan, you are the gold medalist there, you did a degree in engineering and wanted to change your life and lives of people around you. What are the chances that's going to happen? 1940s. The sad news for you is that there is essentially no chance that that's going to happen. The only way you could be wealthy in the 1940s in this area was if you were born wealthy. This was the landed elite of the country. You needed to have large agriculture land. That was the only way you could be wealthy. There was no other way. There was no room for innovation. You had to be born wealthy. You, ne you needed to be born into a landed elite family, the Vadera or the Chaudhary or, or whatever. That was the only thing that could 
help you change your social status to be born there. 1960s. What happened in the 1960s? Can anyone tell me? What's the big thing that happened in the 1960s? Industrial revolution. Industrial revolution. In this country, industrial revolution. What was one thing you could do to become wealthy in the 1960s? You had to be wealthy in 1940s. Why? Because industry requires a large loan which needs to be collateralized against some asset which had to be agriculture land. So if you were not wealthy in 1940s, you couldn't be wealthy in 1960. Bad news for you. You missed the industrial revolution. It was those 300 families that was the landed elite of this country that became rich during the 1960s. There were books written about it, the 300 families of Pakistan because they had the land, the collateral to give to a bank, to raise a loan, to put up an industry. There was no other way. You and I can't go out and put up a spinning mill or a sugar factory or a cement factory or an automobile factory. We can't do it. We don't have the wealth to start with to convince a bank to give us the loan that is required to make this work. It says time's up. Okay. Do this era today. What is one thing that you can do today to become wealthy? Become a tech entrepreneur. In this day and age, all you require is your skill, your education and your energy. Now let, this is not unique to Pakistan. Forbes started publishing the, the list of the wealthiest people in the world in 1982. The first issue came out in 1982. In that issue, out of the 100 wealthiest people in the world, 80% had inherited wealth. 80%. 60% straight off inherited wealth, another 20% oil and gas. Right? 1982. To today, where eight of the ten richest people are tech entrepreneurs. Some college dropouts with no family connections. All they had was a brilliant idea. Some innovative, brilliant idea. And no capital. But then they went to someone called a venture capitalist, which is the best invention of the capitalist world. They didn't have to go and collateralize a piece of agriculture land or a factory or any jewelry or any wealth. All they had to do was convince this venture capitalist that they have a great, brilliant, innovative idea. They can execute it. And this person, this venture capitalist, can share their risk, their upshot and the risk of failure. And that is one instrument that the West has invented to democratize wealth. It democratizes wealth. If someone who has wealth is willing to take an ownership of your company, some stock in your company, because of your brilliant idea and your ability to execute it, you could be Microsoft or Hewlett Packard or Facebook or Yahoo or WhatsApp and so on and so forth. In fact, all those companies happened exactly like this. All these founders were people like you and me. They weren't the landed elite of their country. They didn't have large factories, no family connections. All they had were a great idea, innovative great idea, the skill and the education to execute it. This is beginning to happen in Pakistan. This country has huge opportunities. Monas, I think, has already left, spoke about a few of them. Pakistan has 100 million unbanked adults. 100 million unbanked adults. There are 3 million businesses in these countries that have never been to a bank. 3 million businesses who've never been to a bank. 100 million adults who've never been to a bank. This country is an agriculture country. We're the fourth largest producers of cotton, in the world, fifth largest producers of sugarcane, tenth largest producers of rice in the world. And our per hectare yield is one of the lowest. Anyone working on agri-tech could turn around this country and could change the world just by doubling your per acre yield of rice, cotton, or sugarcane. 
if you can do 10, if you can make 10% of these 100 million unbanked adults talk to a financial institution, understand the importance of savings, a lot of economic rules of Pakistan can go. That's the interest. Therefore, you see all this funding in fintech, in, in agtech, agritech, in edtech. Pakistan has 45 million children going to schools, another 25 million out of school children. If each one of them pays you 50 rupees per month, because you can help them get education much more easily, they don't have to go to tuitions, they don't have to go to a school which offers pathetic education, just 50 rupees per month, this company would have an annual recurring revenue of 200 million dollars. 50 rupees from school going children of this country. That's the size of the opportunity. So you're not in the 1940s, you're not in the 1960s. My friend, your moment, the 22-year-old Pakistani, your moment has arrived. So crap.